Uh, please hold all Dungeons and Dragons questions till after the session. Thank you. Uh, the title of my research is How to Play with Maps, aka um, How to Convince Your Department to Give You Hundreds of Dollars for Video Games. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about some background on maps and games, gamification, um, and how my research bridges maps and games. Uh, maps and games have a lengthy history together and have evolved together with the same technology, especially in the 20th century. Uh, and we can see this evolution in uh, the Legend of Zelda maps over there, uh, where it goes from a very primitive uh, rectangle with one green pixel telling you where you are um, to the beautiful map you see in the lower right-hand corner uh, in the newest installment, Breath of the Wild. And maps also have a somewhat different relationship with games. Um, in fact, many in industries do in general, uh, in what they call gamification. And if you don't know what that is, you probably do. Uh, it's the fact that I've got 48 points at Caribou Coffee, uh, 4,200 award miles with American Airlines. I don't travel too much. And I'm a uh, level one with zero points or badges in Google Maps. Uh, <laughs> This is the type of gamification we're used to. Reward systems, uh, points and achievements, they keep people using your product, and it works. Uh, people will do free work for you if you just give them a badge. Just ask Google. Um, but, but, we're, but what if we're not designing a map for repeated use? Or if we are, uh, maybe a reward system isn't appropriate or seems possible. In fact, reward systems are just a small subset uh, of how you can gamify something. Another very popular uh, game element included in maps is narrative or story. And it's not that stories originated in games, but are definitely an important aspect of video games today. Uh, what other elements are there? And uh, what other elements of games could we use to improve the maps we make? And now that I've beaten the word gamification to death, I want you to forget it and replace it with the prettier sounding gameful design. Mm, yes. uh, we're going to come back to this and act like you never heard gamification, but um, I want to talk more about this relationship between maps and games. I was really inspired by this relationship and my own relationship with maps. Uh, the first map I really used uh, was a video game map, and I used it to navigate the world. It was a paper map that came with the game. Um, and with so many video game players in today's world without driver's licenses, these are the first maps they're seeing and they're using. Um, and it really inspired me to base my thesis around that. Playful maps are nearly identical to maps in the real world, or traditional maps, maps for work. Uh, they represent information to aid the user in completing some task, like wayfinding or learning new information. They fall within the same cartographic principles of representation and interaction. However, maps in games are always a part of some larger purpose. And that purpose is to facilitate gameplay. So you have fun. And this is the biggest difference between traditional maps and playful maps. So I conducted a quantitative content analysis of playful maps and video games to examine these design choices. As we all know, the design choices you make are directly related to the purpose of the map and why you're making that map. So maps designed for play versus work are going to have a lot of different design choices and a lot of different reasonings behind those. So I created 153 codes to analyze 71 maps in 50 games in a five-year span, 2012 to 2016. And the codes that I use surround four categories of gameful design. They're concepts that I gathered from a number of sources on what makes a game and its map good. And I'm going to talk about these categories and how they show up in video games, and then how we can possibly bring some of those lessons back into cartography. The first category is interactive. So when we think about playful maps and games, first we need to think about how games themselves, about games themselves and how the map fits into it all. Uh, many of the same things that make a game good also make a good map in that game. And interactivity is one of the defining traits of a game. So first and foremost, place and playful maps are interactive and use many of the same principles of interactivity 
as traditional maps. The user can dynamically change and control the map. We're familiar with interactivity as a dialogue uh, visualized in this diagram. So we've got a user using a computing device uh, to communicate change to a map. And this is really direct. You can see it's all in a straight line. Um, and I, I dub this primary interaction. Um, and that's because video games exhibit another form of interaction by introducing a new player into our diagram. Pun intended. <laughs> primary interaction is still often possible in games, but now we've added a way to change the map by controlling an in-game avatar. And an in-game avatar is the character or entity that you control in the game. And I call this secondary interaction. Uh, and we're going to go through a little example. So if I control an avatar that moves around in a virtual world, we can see this location um, in the world. Actually, let me get the little laser pointer up there. Does this work? Nice. That little arrow represents the user's location in the world. Uh, this map can be changed, however, through primary interaction. So I've got this cursor here in the center, right there, that little black cursor. And uh, I can annotate this map with a custom marker. Uh, however, I can also change the map through secondary interaction. If I go exploring in the mountains, uh, I can see my location on the map, as this one right there. Uh, and when I've discovered a new location, um, this, the text comes across the screen, bleak, bleak Falls Barrow is discovered and a new symbol is overlaid on the map. Now this is an interaction that you cannot do just when directly interacting with the map. It's only possible through using your avatar. And this is one example of some playful uh, interaction in video games. Uh, and so secondary interaction is something fairly unique to playful maps. Um, and along with interactivity and a possible result of it is the immersiveness of maps. When we hear immersive and cartography or video game, we might Picture virtual reality. However, immersion occurs in all sorts of media without VR. Immersion can occur in two levels. The act of playing the game and, the and being immersed in the context or setting of the game. And what does this look like? Being immersed in the act of playing the game is called diegetic immersion. Um, and the player needs to be immersed in the act, uh, mm, sorry. And this type of immersion isn't unique to video game maps. When you're reading a book or watching a movie, you're immersed in that act as well. And there are design factors of those that contribute to diegetic immersion. If I'm reading a book and the print is too small or the sentences are too complex, it's going to be difficult for me to stay focused and immersed in the act of reading the book. And I might get distracted by my thoughts. Similarly, if a map is hard to engage with, then it's hard to immerse yourself in it. If the UI is bad or the colors are confusing or garish, then it's hard to immerse yourself in the act of engaging and learning from the map. This beautiful map uh, is from Zelda Breath of the Wild and is a good example, I think, of a map for diegetic immersion. Uh, it's got a great color palette. The UI is slick and friendly. Situated immersion is a, <laughs> never thought I'd put a Spy Kids 3D picture in a slide, but here we are. <laughs> Situated immersion is the deeper level of immersion. Immersion in the narrative and virtual world of the game. The player can become so immersed that they start to blend their identity with the identity of the character you're controlling. And not like in some crazy way. But if you watch someone play video games and they'll refer to the avatar, they'll say, oh, there I am, or there, that's me, um, in that sort of way. And the maps should support this type of immersion as well, specifically through representation and interaction. Does the map look like it belongs in the game world? Can you interact with it in the way that your avatar would? You wouldn't expect a futuristic looking map in a medieval game, for example. Immersing the player in both using the map and caring about what it's depicting is a gameful design technique that could translate quite well to traditional cartography. Playful maps deviate from traditional maps the most in their incompleteness. Traditional maps strive to include as much information to the user as possible without compromising the main purpose of the map. Playful maps, however, are void of some of the most important information required to complete the game. And while this seems counterintuitive as cartographers, this incompleteness is what really motivates gameplay, which is the main purpose of the map.
sorry, there's a pop-up that came up. There we go. An incomplete map encourages the user to fill it out, and people have a desire to finish things. Here's an image from Zelda Breath of the Wild. I wonder if I like that game or anything. Uh, <laughs> it was one of the most critically acclaimed games from 2017. And the area of the game is much bigger than what we can see. All that darkness around the edge is explorable territory. And if you're like me, it's frustrating to try and navigate in that space knowing that it can be filled out. And the first thing I did was travel to all of the provinces in the map and get that complete picture of the game space to help me navigate this massive virtual world. Finally, playful maps are inconclusive. Sorry, inclusive. <laughs> Play itself is described as a socially communicative activity, and many games nowadays require more than one human player to play. So games are often inclusive, and their maps need to serve this purpose as well. The map can serve as a, as a tool for players to communicate about the virtual world and the task at hand. And cartographic interaction and representation are used to aid this communication with things like color-coded map annotations available to the player. And so how does inclusiveness show up in playful maps? When we look at this map from Call of Duty World War II, it might be kind of hard to see, um, but we see some red circles and blue arrows. And these represent other player-controlled characters. As you could guess, opposing players are red circles and allied players are blue arrows. And these representational choices are used to depict individuals on their own systems and they also adhere to cartographic guidelines. Inclusive interaction is widespread. Fortnite. Uh, one of the most popular games in the world right now, is very map-centric. Uh, map use is not only encouraged, but is necessary for your success. Uh, the game creators also encourage use of the map as an interactive tool for communication. Players can annotate the map with markers when communicating with teammates on where they want to go. And while the game is online and offers voice communication, players can successfully strategize without speaking by just using the map. And so I've highlighted them in the circles, but it's still kind of hard to see. There's some color-coded annotations that each player can make. So as I showed, these traits are fairly, fairly salient in video game maps, but traditional cartography is different. The end goals are not the same, and if form follows function, then what do gamefully designed maps look like? I don't know. <laughs> I'm hoping you would tell me. But I really like to compare gameful design to graphic design. Sometimes it's hard to pick out something that, that makes good design. Uh, but you can always apply certain principles. I really want to leave it up to you all as an incredibly creative and talented collective of cartographers and then uh, just take credit if you even mention being inspired by games. Uh, I do, however, have some thoughts on areas that could be influenced by the four eyes of gameful design. Accounting for different levels of interaction. It seems weird considering that there aren't avatars in traditional cartography, but maybe it applies if we think about the user as an avatar. Uh, and distinguishing between these levels of interaction and understanding how providing one level of interaction might lead us to a better user experience, especially in things like mobile contexts, where the user's movements could commit changes to the map without touching the screen. Last year, some friends and I made uh, Human Trafficking at Home, an interactive map highlighting human trafficking in the United States. We really wanted to situate the user within the map and the phenomenon itself, as it can happen anywhere, and people can be easily be part of the solution. Immersing your user in the map and the story the map is telling makes it more memorable and gives the user a bigger reason to care about it. Incompleteness is motivating especially in cases where interactivity is present. And so hiding some information and leaving a trail of crumbs for the user to complete it, the map can encourage uh, them to use your map more often. In Mario Kart, <laughs> you can race against people across space and time and watch their every move through the course. Even when going against someone's record, you race against their ghost of that person and that follows every path that they took. Inclusiveness is all about interacting with other people and closely related to geocollaboration in traditional cartography. People in many contexts work across space and time, and this, uh, video games could provide a possible solution for that. 
So there's the four eyes of uh, playful maps. Interactivity, immersiveness, incompleteness, and inclusiveness. You can design a map or any product gamefully by thinking about, its, about these four things. And just like any other design, it may take some skill and finesse, but ultimately could help make your end product as likable and memorable as your favorite game. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. I think we have time for a question. If, and do you want to belt it out? So the question was, do I see any uh, current trends in game maps that might translate well to the real world? Um, there's some really interesting stuff that goes on. Um, I'm going to talk about Zelda Breath of the Wild <laughs> again. But um, in that game, you can annotate the world um, with augmented reality in the game. So your character has this augmented reality thing. and um, you look at this one landscape and let's say I want to go to that mountain, you'll click a button and a marker appears on that mountain and then uh, you look to your map and it's right there. So I think that's something that could totally be done in real world, you know? And it's amazing to think about some of these interactions, so, yeah. All right, once again, let's thank Ross for his talk.